So kind of a review of what we were doing from a bracing goal standpoint is we want to correct foot position, increase range of motion, decrease spasticity, increase base of support, improve functional alignment, decrease energy expenditure. A good overall measure of the outcome of this though is, what did you do to the center of gravity and his base of support? What did you do for balance? The only issue that I run into in clinics where I've got the really crouched gait pattern, I used to see these as kind of a good example. I used to see these patients that they come in, they're crouched and they're tight at the hamstrings. I say, well, there's not a lot we could do for these patients. You know, years ago, I used to, I'd see them in the office and I'd go, oh, it's going to be a long day because I really couldn't. I was failing that patient population because if I put them in a ground reaction and push their knees back, well, what they do, they just came into clinic walking on their toes now, and I made the situation worse. I made a smaller base of support, and they still crouch. So I said, well, we'll make SMOs for these patients, because with the SMOs, at least I can control and protect his joints of his ankle. But that was it. That was the end game there. That was all we had. Um, looking in lines with these goals, um, they're, they're some of my favorite patients to work with now, because what are we doing? We're going after trying to correct the foot position, increase range of motion of the hamstrings. They're going to crouch with the brace that you make them. They don't have the range not to crouch. So what do you do? You accept the crouch, but you're using resistance systems to be able to keep them, like the Daffle FlexiSport, like the Daffle 3.5, to keep them from just collapsing into crouch. As they gain range of motion, those then become even more effective because it's starting to pull them back up. My goal is being met biomechanically. My bracing goals are being met. Why is the crouch gate uh, kiddo, for instance, why is he so excited about gaining range of motion, by the way? What's happening to him? He's doing what when he gains range? He's getting taller is what it is. Unfortunately, you know, with, with Crouch Gate, you've got his buddies that are all growing, and he's not staying the same. He's, he's getting shorter. So what we want to do is give him the height that he actually has, and so in essence, he's growing with it with the program. They're some of my more favorite patients to work with, keeping in line with those goals that we have set forward there. Let's work through a case study here real quick. For time's sake, we're not really focusing on the, the brace selection at this point, but rather on how to optimize and what position really to put the brace in. Uh, for this particular patient. This patient has cerebral palsy, spastic diaplegia, five years old. Goals were to improve his knee extension during gait, achieve full plantar contact, and again, from the list of goals, decrease energy expenditure. The brace that was chosen for this child was the DAFO2, so plantar flexion stop, free dorsiflexion. What are his limitations? What are his patterns? This is what I'm looking at at this point right here, saying what limitations does he have? Okay, can I get his ankle past neutral with a extended knee without collapsing the midfoot is gonna be the, the big problem here for, for Tyler. Here's Tyler here. So here's our kiddo that has, you know, flex knees, heels up in the air on the toes. Does a wonderful job of being able to walk and keep a center of gravity into that little tiny base of support that he has there. So what I've gotta do is find a way. Is there is the solution? Let's take a look and see what, it, what happened with his, uh, his brace here. So as we mentioned, it's a DAFA number two, some optimizations to keep that foot from wanting to be in a, that pronated position. But the question is, was I successful here? Was this patient in a position where they were, we were successful? Well, he looks like he's still up on his toes there. Looks like the heel's in the air. Looks like knee's still in flexion. Okay, so I really haven't gained, I haven't hit those goals of increased base of support decrease energy expenditure. I really haven't met that at that point. Um, sometimes you can't always completely successfully get all of those goals. Um, the example is kind of like the, you know, I always say like somebody has a tight hamstring, for instance. I hear moms all the time say, get your heel down. They're walking and they say, get the heel down, put the heel down. And sometimes they can do that. But oftentimes, because of tight hamstrings, can you take, if you have, you know, a, a reduced popliteal angle, can you get your heel down first? Think about it when you guys leave today. Can you actually, let's say we're, we're tight at the knee here and look what happens. In order for me to get that heel down, I'd have to be way out here to get my heel down. So what happens instead is they hit with that forefoot down and then continue the steps in those fashions there. So not always possible, but we're going after the goals of then increasing range of motion. We work our way down that. So with this kiddo, we'd have to bring the ground up to meet the heel, for instance. We have to change that angle. His angle was at 90 degrees on his brace of his DAFO2. Is that a good position for him at, at this point with his, uh, his ankle alignment? Probably not. So the good thing about the Cascade DAFO systems is there is a full 90 day warranty. Outcomes are subjective and can be hard to predict. Oftentimes there's more than one style of DAFO that may work for that patient. Um, I've never had an issue with calling and saying, 
I tried this brace, it didn't work, I'm going to try this other style of brace with this patient. Okay, that's why they have the 90-day type of warranty that's set up there for that, uh, that exact type of, pop, of population there. So, we can start looking at the hamstrings as we mentioned, we can start adding heel lifts, and ultimately, can we increase our range of motion as well on the ankle itself. So, let's, for a second, let's take time to look at some other interventions that work with us and complement that we tend to be in a position that we work with, with with other family members or team members, I should say, of, uh, of, uh, of different disciplines here. So when it's time to start looking at other interventions, we're saying, how old is this patient? How many times have I tried to get this, this, this to work? Are they seeing physical therapy regularly? What is the reality for the family? Can the family handle these interventions that we're, we're rec about to recommend to them? These are the recommendations we're talking about. We've already kind of started to talk about these is um, common interventions for patients with cerebral palsy. Uh, Botox, for instance. How can that augment us? Okay, what Botox is going to do what, is what? It's going to give us that window of time, that three, two to, two to six month period um, of a window, as I tell families, or opportunities to then go in there through stretching, stretching bracing, um, to go after trying to gain better range to allow us to have other options during the day. So like Tyler, how can I get him to the next level? I need to get to the next level by doing the together everyone achieves more. I've got to work together with the other disciplines. I work very closely with, with our physician that runs our spasticity and movement disorders clinic. Why? Because it offers us opportunities to be able to do more for that patient as a result of it. Sometimes baclofen pumps we're working with. Sometimes muscle and tendon, tendon uh, lengthenings are being done. Selective dorsal rhizotomies. I do a very, very. I work with a very, very large selective dorsal rhizotomy clinic out of, out of St. Louis. So I see a very, very large population. And what do we do? And how do we brace those patients after that? Serial casting. Sometimes you got to put them into a, into a serial casting type program. Here's Tyler, five years old. Lots of bracing attempts. Yes, yes. And ultimately, a selective dorsal rhizotomy was chosen for Tyler. Um, before SDR surgery, again, we weren't really so successful. You know, the knees are still bent, the toes are, he's on his toes, his heels aren't getting down. Um, 11 months after his SDR, now, kind of the qualify a video right after SDR is going to probably see something that's really in a lot of weakness. We do a lot of bracing for a lot of support, lots of solid type of support to the post SDR phase, and then they start to go into how do I get to lower bracing, how do I get to less limitations um, for working with... Uh, with the, uh, having the, the results of the SDR there. So that one we said, hey, we would like you to meet with a team of docs that work very specifically with looking at your spasticity and cutting some of the nerve roots there that are causing some of that spasticity in a very selective manner to see if we can get rid of some of that spasticity and allow him to be able to open the door, get rid of the doorstop, give him the ability to be able to go after using the muscle strengths that he has and develop those muscle strengths. Because remember, the, as we said, the challenging thing about working with patients with cerebral palsy is there's a lot of things going on for that patient that it's out of his control. And so the spasticity kicks in. It's not something he's saying, kick that in. The spasticity may cause muscles to fire for a good time of the gait, but it may be a very, very bad time of the gait pattern as well. So building the team, uh, which professionals do you tend to work with? If you're working with these patients, I always say when I give a talk with cerebral palsy, the very first thing you want to do is you want to be meeting with the physicians that are doing the working with children with spasticity. Uh, we're fortunate enough, Dr. Jan Brunstrom's a neurologist, and uh, you know, there's not a lot of neurologists that I work with that, that put so much passion and energy into working with patients with cerebral palsy. Um, so I, meet, I, I work with Dr. Brunstrom for a long time, and it taught me a lot with working with the patients, I'm working with the spasticity and movement disorders clinics. Um, but the big key here is clinics, emails, um, our goal is really to help parents really stay focused on the goals at hand, because here's what happens. There's lots of things coming into parents. First thing I do when I see a patient in physical, th in physical therapy or in clinic, I find out who is your school therapist? Who do you have therapy at home? Why? I send them an email and connect them, get them all together, and I say, hey, we recommended in clinic this. I want to make sure that the goals you have in mind are in line, because why? She has different goals. And the clinic has different goals, we got a big problem because both of those are going to be very energetic and passionate, hitting mom with that. Um, and the reason I do that is because I try to avoid the question of, you know, parents say to you all the time, they'll say, so what do you think about doing this style of? And what they're really saying to you is, when you answer it, they go, I knew it, i got to call that other therapist and tell her she was wrong. And you go, no, that's, that's not exactly. It's, it's what are the goals we're going after with working with that patient there. So. Post interventions. I gave a, a complete two-hour talk on this with uh, with our physician at our academy meeting, two academy meetings ago, 
on specifically how do you brace patients post Botox and post SDRs. One of the major goals here is maintain range of motion. We as the orthotist now have to get very, very excited because if we can reduce those R1 angles, we may be in a position where we can reassess the range of motion and reassess the bracing plan as a result of this increased range of motion there. We may recast and get a new angle under the kitted as soon as possible, as soon as we start to see this gain here. And then we're gonna to try to maintain by using night stretching type of, type of orthoses to go after uh, working with these. Uh, a good example of this is a patient that, that they received the Botox and we found out that because they, when they got the Botox, um, what happened with this young lady was she had a position where we used plantar flexion block AFO simply because she hyperextended her knee. Once she had the Botox, we found that, hey, you don't hyperextend your knee now unless you start getting tired. So at school, she wore AFOs, and at home, she wore SMOs. So we used it to actually get her down in her bracing style. Selective dorsal rhizotomies, um, again, this is where that team becomes vital to increasing strength for this patient. That's the goals. But we as the orthotist now, once we're out of the immediate phase of, of lots and lots of therapy because they got to get their strength up now because um, the, of the lack of, of the spasticity, so we reassess the range of motion and oftentimes we're reassessing the bracing plan. Oftentimes the less limitations because we don't need as, as many of them. The goal remains still though is to use the least amount of bracing as possible while achieving the most function. In the acute phase as we said, solid ankle designs, um, typically for about six weeks is what happens. So I put them in a turbo design and we like the turbo design because then they, I call it the snake brace for these patients because six weeks later they shed a layer. They get rid of the snake brace and the SMO that's inside of it is a real SMO. So it has the posting all on it. That outer shell has been vacuumed. Yes, it takes up a tremendous amount of room in the shoe, but it's a very, very big, uh, it's a great thing for them because a lot of the kids we see from this as well, three to six kids that are international that I see every single week. And I fit them with a turbo. Six weeks later, they shed that layer and they're wearing the same SMO they've been wearing in that turbo brace. They just shedded the outer layer with it. Um, and then we transition to that SMO as we mentioned as they start to strengthen. They may, some of the kiddos transition to even a little bit less bracing at that point as well. So for the next part here, I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, to Dr. Brunstrom. I'm gonna switch your, your, uh, the computer over here.